Oh, I wasn't gonna. So welcome everyone. Uh, so this is the final seminar of the interrogating um, development seminar of the Department of International Development seminar series uh, that I'm organizing along with my colleague um, Sudhir Salvaraj over here. My name is Ingrid van Graven. Uh, we're both staff in the Department of International Development. And uh, so this uh, series is about bringing big books in that are relevant for development to um, the two kings basically to discuss. Uh, and we have uh, our own uh, staff member joining as well, Rafiq Ziada, who is going to join on the webinar in a second. Um, and um, it's great to see you in person. Uh, it's been, I think, the last one we had in person was in December. Uh, so because of strikes and COVID, it's been a while. Uh, so we have ordered some extra stuff for the reception afterwards. So we hope you'll join for that. Um, and we're very excited today to welcome Nadine Elanani, who is here joining us from Birkbeck um, College. Uh, so she's a reader in law at Birkbeck School of Law and also co-director uh, of the Center for Research on Race and Law. And she teaches and researches in the fields of migration and refugee law, European Union law, pro protest and criminal justice, and her current research projects um, funded by Lever Youth Trust focus on questions of race and justice uh, and justice and death in custody cases and the role of law in addressing health inequalities arising from environmental harm. So a, a lot of really interesting stuff. And she has a book that recently came out called Bordering Britain that she'll speak about today. Um, so she'll present this to us for about 35 minutes and then we'll have our discussant join for another five minutes and then we'll open up uh, for Q&A with all of you that are here in person. And also we have some people that are joining online as well that can also ask questions. So Sudhir is managing the Q&A online. So those of you online, just drop your uh, questions uh, in the chat box and he'll take them from there. Um, so I will then pass the floor over to you, Nadine. Welcome. Thank you so much, um, Ingrid and Sudhir for inviting me to speak today and of course to Rafif, um, for being part of the event and to all of you um, for, for coming to listen, whether you're physically in the room with Ingrid or whether you are online. Um, thank you. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, the book Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to start by talking about how race science was at the core of British colonial rule and how the contemporary British border is a legal fiction, but of course, one with very real and violent effects. I'm going to talk about how one of the um, effects of the border was to erase from memory how Britain came to be one of the richest places in the world and to justify its exclusion um, of those from whom it stole and subjugated. So what I'm gonna do is kind of provide a retelling of Britain's history one which challenges mythological narratives and hopefully allows for new imaginings for the future. So although law announces itself as a rational and neutral set of measures, it's necessarily based on a fiction. What differentiates the violence that's enacted by law from the violence enacted outside of law is that it derives, um, is the notion that the enforcement of law is legitimate because it derives from sovereign power. The sovereign is understood as being of a higher order than those subject to its power. And what I would argue and what many kind of critical legal thinkers argue is that this is fantasy, but one that is given form and substance through custom, institutions, legislation and systems of government. And the fantasy on which British and more widely European sovereignty is based is a very particular kind of fantasy. It's a white Christian supremacist fantasy that drove heady white men in particular to cross oceans and lands and to conquer peoples, enslave them, massacre them, steal their lands and resources and enrich themselves and their families and descendants to come. So British imperial administrations depended on the exploitation of hierarchies that were based on supposed differences between categories of people. The use of race as an ordering principle played an important part in enabling and justifying colonialism. In order for colonists to conquer entire civilizations, 
they needed to be known and filed under terms that were familiar to the colonizer. So Anglo-European scholars of the 18 and 1900s provided the impetus for colonization in their repeated intellectual reductions of entire non-Anglo-European civilizations as being readable, translatable, and ultimately understandable as inferior to Western civilization. And this of course was the justification for conquering them. By contrast, non-Western scholarship even until today remains understood as being an inferior generator of culture and knowledge. So important among the criteria for knowing and ordering civilizations in the colonial era was crucially race, which was invoked as a, a way in which to, to categorize um, groups of people um, and cultures. The production and um, attachment of meaning to the racial in the post enlightenment era um, depended on the use of tools from science and from history. So it makes it especially important to ask, as De Denise Pereira da de Silva does, how racial subjects are created in order to avoid them being reproduced as racial others, as already differentially constituted historical beings before they then enter into modern political spaces and become understood as subaltern subjects. So race becomes an ordering principle at a time when imperial formations were competing with nation states for dominance. And there was a fixation in the enlightenment period with categorizations and classification, establishing what is on the inside and what is on the outside. So on the question of who constitutes humanity, who could be understood as human, it could only be ascertained by determining who can't be considered as human. And so to this end, the context of European colonialism meant that the understandings of humanity were based on a distinction between white Europeans and non-Europeans. The justification of European colonization on the basis of white supremacy was therefore not predetermined but the result of theorizations of fixed racial difference. So the violence of colonialism is, of course, not purely semantic. An extreme level of physical threat, force and brutality was administered to maintain the British Empire. Colonizers have always been aware that despite their claim to have founded a durable order, that that order rested on a reversible relation of forces people could rise up against colonialism and change that order. So the possibility for the reversal of colonialism through the actions of resistance movements required extreme violence and its constant threat against subjugated populations. At the same time, dismissals and brutal crackdowns of struggles for self-determination in the colonies necessitated justifications that rested on constructions of difference. In order to justify that brutal treatment, people had to be argued to be inferior, non-human, and therefore could be subjected to extreme forms of violence. So the tendency in enlight Enlightenment thought to categorize nature and man into types, the exaggeration of which were assumed to be general features, the reduction of countless objects to being orderable and describable types, was applied with devastating consequences in the colonial era to people. Ideas about racial superiority and inferiority underpinned the division of cultures into civilized and uncivilized and served as normative justifications for colonial conquest. For instance, British colonizers subjugated Aboriginal Australians and Native Americans, constructing them as having failed to socially progress, partly on account of their different relationship to land and thereby justified colonial intervention, dispossession of their land and rule. So within an Anglo-European understanding of linear time, indigenous people were seen as being primitive and contemptible, inhabiting a past era, one which Europeans had transcended. Edward Said thus described sovereign orders as a monstrous chain of command based on divisions of humanity and progress. For Said, the consequences of dividing humanity into clearly different cultures, histories, traditions, societies, and races cannot be survived. And there is, of course, a specificity to the version of white supremacy which underpinned British colonialism. Colonists operating at the height of the expansion of the British Empire 
propagated the idea that white British people were supreme over all other people, including other white Europeans who were engaged in their own colonial projects. In 1877, for instance, in Confessions of Faith, Cecil Rhodes wrote, it is our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory, and we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses. Considering that Britain invaded 90%, so 171 of the current 193 members of the United Nations, it's not difficult to imagine the depth of arrogance and political investment of British colonists in the idea of white British supremacy. So the ideas and practices of racial ordering that I've just been discussing, I argue that they are constitutive of, they make up contemporary British immigration law. By allocating life and death on the basis of whether or not a person meets the criteria for a legal status, and by preventing those who do not from accessing Britain, law is central to ongoing processes of colonial dispossession. Law is the structure which underpins Britain's self-identification as an enclosed space within which resources and wealth obtained via colonial conquest belong to Britons conceived in large part as white. Law's categorization of people into groups, those with and without rights of entry and stay, make the latter disproportionately at risk of violence and premature death. Immigration law thus falls within Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism as the state-sanctioned production of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the description of racism as structurally produced is helpful for understanding the way in which systems of meaning and control, of which law is one, distribute chances at life and death. It allows us to move away from traditional discrimination law frameworks, which concentrate on locating an individual who can be found to have intentionally discriminated, shifting the focus instead onto harmful conditions that are experienced across populations that the state targets for abandonment. The effect of law's division of people into groups with differentiated rights is to create hierarchies of people, some of whom have access to territory or to basic resources, a chance at survival, whilst others don't. The particular population immigration law targets for abandonment is the racialized poor the vast majority of whom have personal, ancestral, or geographical histories of colonization. For racialized people, the border is neither easily navigable, nor is it temporally and spatially limited. Whiteness as embodied racial power is apparent in the ease with which most white people cross borders and move through white hegemonic spaces. White people tend not to be subject to stringent, stringent visa requirements, and racial profiling, whereas the vast majority of racialized people are unable to buy tickets for travel or to board planes due to visa rules and carrier sanctions, and are disproportionately stopped in search. This encounter with the border is itself a racializing process, so it makes people vulnerable, it makes people disproportionately vulnerable to harm. People who don't have a right of entry are forced to undertake um, dangerous, often fatal journeys, and the right of uh, and not having a right to remain or to stay can mean homelessness, a lack of access to vital resources like healthcare, not being able to access work, being confined to a detention center and being subject to deportation. People in these conditions are at risk of being subjected to physical and mental violence and even death. As the hostile environment policy demonstrates, racialized people also experience internal borders, which are invisible and permeable for most white people. Borders follow and surround people as they try to access the basic means of life. Sarah Keenan has shown how borders attachment to racialized people means that they take with them the space of the border. In her work on race and time, she describes race as a temporal category to be understood in terms of how long racialized subjects are able to survive in the world. So a spatial and temporal understanding of British immigration law allows us to see how it works to place land and resources, healthcare, welfare, security and opportunities, all of which can be understood as modern day manifestations of stolen colonial possessions 
out of reach of the vast majority of those with ancestral or geographical histories of colonization. Sarah Ahmed writes, what is reachable is determined precisely by orientations we have already taken. A world that was made white through colonialism is home only for bodies that can inhabit whiteness. She, she writes that bodies remember histories of colonialism even when we forget them, that histories of colonialism surface on the body, meaning that race becomes a social as well as a bodily given. Colonialism has meant that the vast majority of racialized people have inherited the impossibility of extending the body's reach. So whilst categorization is important for the creation of meaning, it's when systems of categorization and the assertion of power come to align themselves or be aligned that racial subjugation becomes possible. So it's helpful to understand race as Alana Lenton does as a series of logics and structures that mutually inform and constitute the other. And it's helpful to understand migration law as a racial regime of power as part of a colonial edifice. And it allows us to see the danger of accepting legal categories as givens. While legal categories may be articulated in terms that are race neutral, their effect is to enable the colonial state to administer racial violence. Legal categories such as refugee and citizen legitimize the incarceration and expulsion and even death of those who are deemed not to fall within the criteria required for granting of these statuses. So the widespread acceptance of legal categories of people moving as defined in international and national law ends up normalizing the racial violence in which the legal system itself is implicated. So the assumption that legal categories are neutral and fair operates, as I've been saying, to mask the violence that they actually produce and sustain themselves. So we need some unmasking, the telling of a more accurate history of law and its relationship to colonial violence. One that can help us to challenge the fiction that Britain is a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state. Britain, of course, would not be the wealthy place that it is without its colonial history. Colonialism and slavery were key to its industrialization and the growth of its capitalist economy. In 1833, Britain abolished slavery only to raise the equivalent of 17 billion pounds in compensation to be paid to British slave owners for the loss of their property. The funds paid out built and infused Britain's commercial, cultural, imperial and political institutions. Wealth derived from British slave ownership has by no means been evenly distributed in Britain. It's helped to enrich and sustain elite institutions, individuals and families, and has sown inequality deep into the fabric of British society, helping to make it the most unequal place in Europe. Yet Britain's healthcare system, welfare state, transportation infrastructure, its cultural and educational institutions, are battered and unequally accessible in the wake of privatization, but they must still be understood nevertheless as colonially derived, along with the private wealth amassed over the course of the British Empire and retained after its defeat by systems of inheritance. So to see how Britain came to be understood, not as what it is, the spoils of empire, but as a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, we need to travel back to the 1960s, 70s and 80s, which are particularly important decades in the story of immigration law and the making of modern Britain. Um, as colonial populations fought the British from their territories, British lawmakers fast abandoned the myth of imperial unity and equality and moved to introduce controls targeted at racialized colonial subjects and Commonwealth citizens. This legislation culminated in the 1981 British Nationality Act, which raised for the first time the idea of a post-imperial territorially defined Britain. It severed a notionally white, geographically distinct Britain from the remainder of its colonies and the Commonwealth. Through the concept of patriality, which was invented by the 1971 Immigration Act, um, whiteness was made intrinsic to British identity. So a patrial was a person who was born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain, and only patrials had a right of abode and therefore a right of entry and stay in Britain. In 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. 
So we can see that the effect of the legislation was racial exclusion. And the 1981 Act continued this process of racial exclusion by constructing British citizenship on the foundation of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality. So citizenship ended up also being tied to the right of entry and abode. Conservative Home Secretary at the time, William Whitelaw said of the Act that it is time to dispose of the lingering notion that Britain is somehow a haven for all those whose countries we used to rule. And this move was materially and symbolically significant. A territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that made, British, that made Britishness commensurate with whiteness made it clear that Britain, the landmass and everything within it belonged to Britons who were conceived intrinsically as white. The 1981 Act did not therefore signify an end to British colonialism, but was itself a colonial maneuver. It was an act of appropriation, a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure secured through centuries of colonial conquest. So understanding Britain as a contemporary colonial space in this way allows us to question the distinction between settler and non-settler colonial contexts. While it tends to be an accepted argument in critical scholarship that settler colonialism is ongoing and structural, the same critique hasn't been applied in the same, to the same extent to non-settler forms of colonialism, which are generally understood to have ended. Yet the border drawn around the, the spoils of British colonial conquest by immigration and nationality law can be argued to amount to an unredressed act of colonial theft due to mainstream understandings of property as being fixed and immovable in space and time, theft by the passing of immigration controls can be difficult to conceptualize. Along with the resources and labor that were stolen in the course of colonialism, the social and cultural networks and relationships that were annihilated or radically reformulated as a result of colonial conquest were also material losses. Colonial dispossession, not only determined the contemporary distribution of material wealth, but it also radically altered subjectivity in the sense of what people desire, consider themselves as entitled to and understand themselves to be. Theft of intangibles such as economic growth and prospects, opportunities, life chances, psyches and futures occur in all colonial contexts, settler or otherwise. The effect of the 1981 Act along with the changes to immigration law, was to put the wealth of Britain, gained via colonial conquest, out of reach for the vast majority of people racialized through colonial processes, most of whom with geographical or ancestral histories of British colonialism. The immigration law not only serves as the means of obstruction of movement, it is also the means through which legal status is granted. While critiques of recognition are well established in settler colonial studies, Again, the same critique hasn't been made in relation to Britain. Regimes of legal status recognition, whereby British authorities determine entitlement to statuses such as citizenship, settlement, and indefinite leave to remain or refugee status, serve to legitimize the claim that colonial wealth, as it manifests in Britain, belongs behind its borders only to be accessed with permission. Similar to the way in which indigenous people in Canada and Australia must submit to the rules and evidentiary standards of colonial legal systems in order to be recognized as having enforceable rights to land. Those with ancestral geographical and personal histories of colonialism and British colonialism who wish to access stolen colonial wealth and resources in Britain have to submit to the rules and standards of British immigration law. In this way, a fiction of racial inclusion has been written in the forms of paths to legal status recognition which dole out immigration statuses to select racialized people who can fulfill certain criteria. Meanwhile, the vast majority of racialized people are prevented from accessing Britain in part through the operation of internal and external borders. But it's important to remember that the bestowal or extension of British subjecthood, or we can call it citizenship in its current guise, can never be understood as anything other than a colonial act. In the colonial era, British subjecthood was held up as a superior category from which the civilizing benefits of British rule flowed. 
But we know that British colonialism was genocide, mass murder, slavery, dispossession of land, exploitation of labor and theft of resources, all predicated on white British supremacy. Even so-called free racialized British subjects who tried to move to different parts of the British empire were met with racist immigration laws in places such as Canada and Australia. British subjecthood did not therefore protect racialized subjects from the violence of white British supremacy. Its very existence as a legal category was a manifestation of that violence. Whenever it has suited the British government, it has treated its own subjects as aliens for legal purposes, evicting them from the scope of legal status and protection with devastating consequences. We see this really clearly with the hostile environment policy where it denied many of the Windrush generation and their children access to healthcare, housing, employment, and other vital services, and led to them being detained and expelled in many cases. So, as I mentioned before, the traditional acceptance of legal categories as defined in international and domestic law in and outside academia has the effect of hiding law's role in producing racialized subjects and racial violence. And it also stops us from understanding law itself as racial violence. We can take, for example, the category of the refugee, which tends to be valorized as compared with the irregularized migrant, increasingly less so under the current government. Individuals falling outside the legal definition of a refugee are often described as illegal, as irregular, as economic migrants, and are at risk of being denied um, access to healthcare and housing and removed. A decision to deny legal status carries serious, sometimes fatal consequences. If we can address the historical contingency and artificiality of legal categories and the violence in their production, then we can understand how Britain remains colonially and racially configured. And we can also think of new ways um, that resist a politics of recognition, that resist the overarching power, the overarching assertion of the law to, to the power to, to determine who has a right to access Britain and resources and who doesn't. If we can think outside of this framework, we can move towards more reparative forms of justice and resistance. Because legal status doesn't actually alter the way in which racialized people are cast in white spaces as undeserving guests, as outsiders or intruders as here today, but always potentially gone tomorrow. Immigration law is after all the prop that is used to teach white British people that what Britain plundered from its colonies is theirs and theirs alone. Immigration law is not therefore the seemingly harsh but fair mode through which the deserving are separated from the undeserving. Instead, it's a vital mechanism for ensuring that colonial wealth remains out of the hands of those from whom it was stolen. Racialized people in Britain, whether categorized as citizens, migrants, refugees, or asylum seekers, are habitually understood as having come from somewhere else. Britain's post-colonial articulation of its borders and national identity has driven the assumption that anyone who is not white could not be from Britain. Manifestations of this assumption are heard daily across Britain, whether in the form of the subtly disguised racist question, where do you come from originally, or the avowed racist slur, go back to where you came from. In 2013, Theresa May's Home Office plastered, plastered the decree, go home or face arrest, on Vans' commission to drive around London in areas where racialized people live. Leave, which became the designation for the campaign for Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, began to take on a double meaning, embodying the go home dictum as a rejection of anyone deemed to be a migrant. Meanwhile, people considered not to have a legal right to remain in Britain are expelled to places that are not home. The legal system thus enacts the go-home decree, the deportation flights carried forward by the justification that people without legal status do not belong in Britain. While racism drives these utterances and enactments, they are also propelled by something else, the idea that Britain is somewhere and not everywhere. And I'll return to this thought later. We can turn to post-colonial critique um, to offer us the possibility for a counter pedagogy to that of law. Immigration law's lesson is one of differentiation in human worth and the crystallization of racial hierarchies through legal categorization. 
For the colonial British state to function, it, all, it has always depended on Britons, 87% of whom are white, to imbibe a sense of entitlement and superiority over racialized people. Immigration, refugee and citizenship law regimes in their legitimization of differentiated access to resources according to immigration status, convey the lesson that, British that the British national project is one of white ownership of colonial spoils, a project which is under constant threat from people who do not belong in Britain. A post-colonial critique of immigration law, which understands it as ongoing colonial violence, disrupts this lesson that law teaches and forces instead an analysis of contemporary movement that accounts for colonial histories and legacies. So what might be some of the contents of a counter pedagogy to that of law? So-called host states should be understood as colonial spaces and irregularized movement as anti-colonial resistance. And by calling for a reconceptualization of irregularized migration as anti-colonial resistance, I'm not relying on a reformer strategy which would require nation states or international organizations to introduce measures which might facilitate a more re redistributive migration regime. Because as Leah Cowan writes, the current border regime demonstrates that the state will never meaningfully legislate for open, relaxed or no borders, because to do so would be to blur the edges of its own power. Secondly, although limited redistribution occurs as a result of immigration, for instance, via the practices of sending remittances and the physical redirection of resources towards migrants present in Britain, the facilitation of migration in and of itself does little to contest broader ongoing colonial structures. And I'm also not proposing irregularized migration as a practical strategy for resisting ongoing colonial violence in the form of immigration and border control, and this isn't to deny that irregularized migration can be seen or does indeed embody a practice of resistance in contesting the border and forcing a redistributive element into the relationship between Britain and its former colonies. Indeed, it is precisely the irregularity, the illegality of the relationship that gives irregularized migration its radical anti-colonial reparative and redistributive dimension. In being illegal, it amounts to a forcible return of something that was stolen in a context in which the laws being breached, immigration and border controls, are designed specifically to obstruct this outcome. Nevertheless, irregularized people are made vulnerable to extreme conditions of racial terror, both in their journeys and attempts to cross borders, as well as in their efforts to navigate legal status recognition processes and hostile environments pre and post arrival. Rather, the rethinking I offer of, re of, a, of a regularized migration as anti-colonial resistance is intended as an insistence on a recognition that the mainstream and accepted story of Britain's making is fiction. The story serves to justify the violence and injustice of Britain's contemporary border regime. Rather than being seen as rightfully at the mercy of legal status recognition processes, racialized people must be both understood and understand themselves as being collectively entitled to reclamation of wealth accumulated via colonial dispossession. There is an urgent need for a politics of migrant solidarity and racial justice in colonial contexts, which resists that of state recognition. Such a politics, in the words of Bell Hooks, would, be, would require that we stop being so preoccupied with looking to that other for recognition, and instead we should be recognizing ourselves and then seeking to make contact with all those who would engage us in a constructive manner. As scholars and activists, we must acknowledge the connections between historical and ongoing racial projects of capitalist accumulation and contemporary migratory movements and question former colonial powers claims to legitimate and defensive, defensible sovereign borders policed and reproduced through immigration, asylum and nationality law. Much legal scholarship is implicated in propagating an ahistorical discourse which fails to address the role of immigration and refugee law concepts in sustaining structures of violence. Understanding how Britain came to be one of the wealthiest places in the world and how immigration law is deployed to exclude from, from its national project those at whose expense Britain was built is another important step towards formulating internationalist anti-imperialist racial justice strategies. Colonial subjects dispossessed of resources and then of access to Britain were intrinsic to its making. 
as George Orwell wrote in 1939, the overwhelming bulk of the British proletariat does not live in Britain, but in Asia and Africa. He describes the British empire as nothing but a mechanism for exploiting cheap colored labor. Aditya Mukherjee has shown how at the heart of colonialism lay surplus appropriation from the colony to the metropolis. In the case of India, unrequited transfers whereby the colony paid for the exports of its own products to Britain served as a massive and protract protracted drain on the Indian economy while simultaneously contributing to Britain's economic sustenance and growth. The fact that colonized populations grew and sustained the British economy is juxtaposed with the habitual official denial that Britain owes anything to those it enslaved and colonized. This erasure manifests in part through the refusal to engage in processes which would see Britain pay reparations to colonized nations. In 2015, then Prime Minister David Cameron on a visit to Jamaica refused to apologize or engage on the question of payment of reparations for Britain's role in the transatlantic slave trade, preferring instead to move on from this painful legacy and continue to build for the future. And the future building Cameron was particularly interested in was the 25 million pound British aid funded prison to which people with Jamaican nationality convicted of criminal offenses in Britain could be sent to serve out their sentences. Although this particular project wasn't implemented, Britain has contributed to such prison building projects, for example, in Nigeria, another of its former colonies. The presence in Britain of racialized people from countries with histories of colonization has the effect of challenging and troubling white supremacist structures. Sarah Keenan has noted the way in which significant political potential can come when particular bodies that do not belong, according to a dominant network of belonging, nonetheless remain in place. This troubling occurs in part through the taking up of physical space, but also in serving as a defiant reminder of Britain's colonial identity and the origins of its wealth. So to conclude, the Imperial Vanishing Act performed by changes to immigration and nationality laws in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, had the effect of casting Britain's imperial history into the shadows. The British empire about which Britons know little can be remembered fondly as a moment of past glory, as a gift once given to the world. The erasure has been so complete that conservative MP Liam Fox could declare in 2016 that the United Kingdom is one of the few countries in the in the European Union that does not need to bury its 20th century history. And in 2019, the British government could take umbrage at the European Union's perfectly accurate description of Gibraltar and a legal document as a British colony. In announcing itself as post-colonial, Britain cut itself off symbolically and physically from its colonies and the Commonwealth, taking with it what it had plundered. While Britain may appear to be an island, it in fact remains everywhere. The British Empire's legacies of racism, slavery, labor exploitation, land dispossession, bordering and plunder are to this day felt viscerally across the world. It's not only with the confinement of British colonialism to the past that its former subjects, whether categorized today as citizens, migrants, refugees, or asylum seekers can be understood to have come from somewhere else. If Britain is acknowledged as being everywhere, its colonial legacy still reaching like tentacles across the world, then Britain is where we are from. In this way, the dictum go home becomes paradoxically, subversively an invitation to stay. Thank you. Audience clapping, thank you very much. That was really, um, that was really great. So um, now I would like to invite uh, Rafid Siada, who is here uh, online to jump in as discussant. So Rafid is a lecturer here in the Department of International Development at King's and her research focuses broadly on political economy, uh, gender and race with a particular focus on the Middle East and East Africa. And she co-edited the book Revolutionary Feminisms with Brenna Bandar recently. And she's also worked as a researcher and campaign organizer with a number of refugee rights and anti-poverty NGOs. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Rafi. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you very much, Ingrid. Can you hear me all right? 
That's perfect. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, so first, thanks to Ingrid and Sudhir for organizing all of the sessions. Um, and I know how much how, how hard it is to keep going week on week. So thank you both. Um, Nadine, it is a pleasure to be with you on one webinar finally. I wish we were doing it in person, but yalla, inshallah, next time around. Um, it was such a pleasure to revisit the book. Um, I had read it when it first came out, and I was reading it this week with everything that's happening around the world um, with a lot of anger about um, how refugees are treated and the differential um, ways that refugees are treated when we suddenly see, after so much talk of a refugee crisis over decades, um, the borders opening and people being taken in. Um, also, all the racist terminology that was so openly used in the news about wars in the Middle East, and it's the people from over there who live with war. So it was really, um, I was very grateful to have a book that historicized the legacies of colonialism and how they are still a present with us today. Um, it was also really important for me in this moment with what's happening in the context of universities in the UK, the conversations around the gender pay gap, but also the ethnicity pay gap and how we keep speaking about widening participation. Um, yet, you know, for those of us who are not on high incomes, having our pensions slashed and all the, the way British Academy is heading um, is not about widening participation. And the fact there's been hardly any movement on issues like the ethnicity pay gap is a question of racialization. So it was both internally in terms of our work day to day and in terms of what's happening in the world that I found the book tremendously useful and helpful and just such a pleasure to read. Um, so firstly, thank you so much for taking the time to write it. Um, I probably have too many questions for you, but first let me start by just saying what I really appreciated about the book. Um, I thought the book brought together literatures that normally do not speak to each other in a very interesting way. Um, and I often wonder this because there was a, a big rise in the literature on borders, but much of that did not deal with racialization or race in general. And then there's an entire literature on refugees, refugee law and asylum that also does not deal with racialization. So what I really loved about your book was that without you know, saying, I am sitting in these literatures, you actually made them speak to each other and really brought out the thread of race and racialization, but also a reckoning with colonialism. So it was really a tour de force of bringing together a history of migration, looking at colonialism and how colonialism still impacts us today, a history of the present. Um, and although it starts historically, it brings us to the current moment and that, that kind of historicization that takes both race and colonialism very seriously, I think we're desperately missing. And this book fills that gap um, in a very particular way that's extremely insightful and I think can bring out other research within this field. And I hope people um, continue in this vein of thinking. Um, the other thing I thought was really well done is that it captured the anxieties and debates around migration that we constantly seem to be having in this country um, and put them in historical context, but also in the context of colonialism. And doing these things together while giving a critique of law is not an easy feat. Um, so you were, you were working at multiple registers uh, in wonderful ways that I really appreciate. And you know, I'm not a lawyer, so being able to capture you know, the legal side of it and that documentation of the, the legality and bring in race to how those legal categories are constructed um, to me was really useful and really helpful in thinking through categories of law that we normally don't interrogate. Um, and the critique around how these categories are used by activist movements was also a thread that carried through throughout and was, I thought, really well done and gives us a very important critique of law, but also of social movements and how they operate. Um, I am a little bit obsessed with the circulation of ideas between settler colonies, colonies, and how they move with us to this day. Um, and I agree with you fully in what you say in the book. People usually talk about settler colonies as if they're this completely different history. And then colonialism is in a different space, but often constructed as the past. The, the transmission though of these um, laws, especially around migration, 
from the colonies to the metropole, um, we don't often theorize it enough and how much of a transmission there was between colony, settler colony, and that a lot of these laws actually initi get initiated in the colonies and settler colonies first. Um, interestingly, um, I had I worked on Canada's white settler policy. So it was really interesting to see the flip side of that and how it was Canada's white settler policy that impacted how the British one gets formulated. Um, I, I think those kinds of intersections and, and the speaking to each other of these settler colonial situations is really interesting and well done in a very detailed way through the different acts that you look at. Um, and finally, the part about, you call it, welfare as entitlement to colonial spoils. Uh, that really spoke to me around, for us who teach in development studies, thinking of colonial spoils and the continuity of colonial spoils. Because normally, you know, you have, if we're looking just at economic models of the moment, we don't think historically around colonial spoils and how they get constructed. So for me, this was really interesting thinking about history as well as scale, um, when we think not just of the nation state, but also what happens external to the nation state. So for our students who are thinking about development, that movement of scale between the international, the national, the colony and the metropole really came out. And I, I like the terminology of entitlement to colonial spoils um, as, a, as a turn on what these immigration laws are really about and that people are still benefiting from colonial spoils with no recognition of that. Um, so that's everything I loved, which I thought was tremendous and very, very, again, I'll say very useful for me to read in this, in, with the past two weeks of everything going on in the world. Um, and I had a few questions more as a start to a conversation, I think, on different things, and feel free to answer all of them or none of them or engage with which whatever part you like. Um, the first thing I had said about the literature in terms of there's the borders literature, critical borders literature, and then there's the race literature, and then there's the legal critical legal studies, and they seem to never speak to each other. Um, and nowadays we have a lot more work on abolition, of course, and it's starting to speak a little bit to migration, but hasn't really yet. Um, so I wanted to ask you first, why you think that is? Is it is it something analytical that makes these literatures not speak to each other? Is it simply academic in that academia, we need to say, you know, this is where I'm situating myself. And for your work, because it sits within all these literature, what do you think that does? What do you think it brings out when you bring this lens of race and critique of the law? into the conversation. Because for me, it just makes for such a much richer historical analysis. And I wonder how what, what you felt about that and if, if you feel it's important for these other literatures, are we heading in that direction or not? Um, another thing you bring up in the book is the, the law itself and how it can be a tool against social movements and it can also be accommodationist. So you really elegantly bring out the, the contradictions in law but and the limits of recognition as well uh, and what that means for building solidarity. But I wondered, uh, the question for me was about the border itself. Um, you know, there's all the debates about no one is illegal and let's have no borders. Uh, because the book is called Bordering Britain, I was wondering where you see yourself within that debate, if it's relevant, um, because you mentioned the paragraph where you say you don't think the state will get rid of borders, which I, I agree with you. I'm just wondering on the flip side then, um, what does that mean for us? And and how are, how are you theorizing the border itself? The book deals quite extensively with various immigration laws, but I was wondering about your take on the border in particular. One thing that really attracted me in the introduction was the idea of street level racist violence. And in the context of the UK, I thought you were going to do a lot around the resistance aspect and the anti-racist movements and how they have also shaped immigration law. Um, a lot of responses to movements, um, the era of multiculturalism with all 
the horrors that came out of that also had to do with people pushing um, specific things. So, and you cite a lot of the people who were active in these movements. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about that question of not just the law, but also resistance to it and how that formulates and shapes migration. Um, I know we have some students with us on the call and a lot of our students are writing about the border. So I wanted them to hear from you about writing on migration and the ethics particularly of writing about migration because migration in particular became a very big topic in academia. Many, many people were doing it um, almost because it became a fancy topic. And since this is something you write about, I think hearing from you about the ethics of border studies and how that works and migration would be extremely useful. Um, and finally, I guess the question on everyone's mind <laughs> is with what's been going on lately around Ukraine and refugees coming from Ukraine and this idea of the deserving migrants versus undeserving migrants. Many people have been framing it as a question of like Western hypocrisy. Um, but the story that you tell in the book is really a much longer history of this, this kind of rejection happening over and over and over in various forms and, and the law being the underpinning way that it actually functions, like law as racialization as an underpinning of this racialization. And I've been thinking in the past two weeks less on the note of hypocrisy, but actually complicity um, that, you know, with, with all of the refugees that have been coming from various parts of the world, the, the difference in language and even the, the media formulation has been really quite remarkable to watch. So I was wondering in light of your book and everything that you studied in the book, how you see um, what's been happening, how you would theorize it, um, how angry is it making you, is it is making you as angry as it's making me? Um, because it, it would be nice if we could extend this kind of welcome to refugees at all times, not just selectively. Um, so I asked you many questions please feel free to deal with whichever one you like uh, or throw any of them out the window. But thank you for bringing all of these threads together. Um, I think we really need so much more work of this, of this caliber around race and colonialism because the, the reckoning with colonialism has certainly not happened. Um, we still see conversations about how great it was and how useful trains were for the colonial world. And I think when we're dealing with development and our students are thinking through development, ideas like colonial spoils, um, thinking about circulation of wealth and how it ends up in its various forms is, is really important. And I hope the students get a lot out of it and everybody should uh, go out, buy the book and read the book and engage with the book. Thank you. Um, Ingrid, shall I come in now or do you want to? Yeah, uh, I think it would be, yeah, I think it'd be great for you to respond and then, um, while you're responding, those of you in the audience can start to formulate your questions and those of you online as well can start putting them in the Q&A box. Uh, but yeah, I think yeah, you got a lot of questions. Thank you so much, Rafif, for that um, great response. Uh, so yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Medina. Oh, Rafif, I mean, you weren't here at the beginning, I think, when, you know, I just thanked you kind of, you know, for just agreeing to be part of this, because I know how much work it is actually to be a discussant. I feel it's so much more work sometimes than writing a new paper of your own or, you know, to actually engage with someone's book like this. And it, it's a huge honor to have you of all people do it. And I, you know, I have so much respect and appreciation, admiration for, for the work that you do. Um, and I, I was so, you know, I felt thrilled and spoiled to have you um, agree to do this. And you have given me some that you've really given the book an incredibly um in-depth and generous reading which I am certain it doesn't deserve but I I'm really really so so appreciative um uh, of your engagement with it and you know it it it's always it, it always feels good to 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 hear just someone say that something is helpful right now in the moment when as you say we're surrounded by this stuff that makes us feel enraged and alone and like there's nowhere to vent one's anger and frustration or do anything and and you know, to just have something that you can read that makes you feel you know, to think that, that that you might be reading something I wrote that makes you feel kind of somehow 
uh, you know, to have something to hold on to in those moments is just really all I can really hope for for the book. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Although, of course, I wish its afterlife, you know, wasn't that long and that it didn't keep, you know, having to provide that kind of um, uh, do that kind of work um, for people. However, um, thank you so much for all of the questions. I mean, yeah. I it's interesting what you say about literature, because I don't think I have um, a really great answer in terms of how I position myself or how I got all of these literatures to speak to each other, except to say that I have always felt like I don't belong in law or I don't feel comfortable with with law. I mean, it actually amazes me that anyone can write a paper about refugee law or asylum law or migration law and not mention the word race. But actually, the vast majority of that scholarship absolutely does that. And I, I still can't quite believe it, even though I've been in this field, you know, <laughs> for a very long time now, it, it, it still amazes me. And so it's not really like to me, it's not really like, oh, I've gone to this great effort to do this work. It's just like a sense that this is an impossible thing that like, I could not possibly speak about refugees or migrants without trying to understand race and racialization. But um, it is absolutely true that the way in which law is taught is you can go through your whole degree with, you know, really just thinking or um, working in a way that imagines that the law just kind of fell out of the sky one day. And now this is what it is. And these are the factual scenarios that surround us. And this is how we apply the law to these factual scenarios. And OK, you've got your law degree off you go in, out into the world. And it absolutely is for me so important to teach law in a way that recognizes law in its historical, social, political context, and to really understand it in the way we might understand really any other phenomena. It's not something special. It's not something that we can kind of separate off and say, or even to, to think, you know, it's special because of its claims to justice, to have justice as its core, to have equality at its core. Um, because actually, when we start kind of inscribing it with these um, moral and um, high uh, notions and purpose, is it begin? We become deferential towards it, and I think it's so dangerous in area like immigration law to become deferential because that's exactly what's at the heart of of this sense of entitlement. Is because you say, well, the law is on my side, and if the law is on my side, then I must be right. And if the law is not on that person's side, well, then may they drown at sea, and it doesn't matter because they don't have the right to be here anyway. Like you know, and we saw during Brexit that that would actually be the discourse. The, the, the discourse was reduced to the sense if, you, if the law is not on your side, then for all I care, you can lose your family, lose your home, lose your life, whatever. Um, and so it, it's, it's so pernicious and it's so violent and it's the work the law does. And so for me, it was necessary to just really understand um, the, the role that law plays in both shaping psyches and mindsets and how it does that um, um, and, you know, and how it operates, you know, at an institutional level as well. Um, it, it, and uh, in terms of looking, looking at the law and how it's applied. Um, uh, so, so I, so I, so I hope what my, I mean, this sounds really um, crude, but I hope what the book brings out is kind of just some truth about law and just some 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 sense that the law is not this thing high up that we can't touch but that we can drag it in to what the, all the other stuff we're reading and thinking about um and just put it put it on equal you know measure with everything else and 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 and, and um subjected to the same level of critique as we would subject anything um whether it's you know an advertisement or um something so a politician says in parliament or um you know anything we might read you know the the law is just something else that we need to be like actually um subjecting to, to the same kind of critique um you asked me about the theorization of the border and and yeah i often get asked the question of like oh so you know you don't really talk about no borders and i'm and i think no i, I don't but but that's because it's obvious, like, um, as you said, like, it's very clear where the book is is going. I, I, what I kind of wanted to basically, I don't know, actually, it's, it's probably just how I am, but I don't really put myself in any particular camp. It's more just like, if you, if you read the book, you can't help but see it's, it's a no borders argument. However, it's a very um, specifically located no borders argument around Britain. And I wanted really to subject the British border in particular to an analysis that 
you might say is only applicable to the British border, or I might say that because I don't, but I mean, I don't think it's true. I think, of course, you can apply this analysis in the book to other European um, colonies, um, probably to other places in the world too. Um, but what I wanted to be able to say is that this is Britain's story, because I think the work that Britain does in the world, especially at the time I was writing the, the book with Brexit, etc., was so harmful and so horrific and has been. And I just felt that the British border needed kind of taking down. Um, like I really wanted to make the case for Britain not to be able to be understood as legitimately bordered. So it's absolutely no borders. It's absolutely um, calling for the, the, the dismantling of the British border, saying that there is no um, justification for it. Um, whether, you know, I, I would extrapolate that about every border everywhere. I mean, that, that I, I would say I'm no borders politically, but I don't want to say that that's what the book is doing because I want it to be also a very specific story because I, I think it strengthens the argument to, to have done this work very carefully around uh, around a specific location. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the question you asked me around street violence and resistance and how resistance movements shape um, the law and um, I, 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 I agree that that the book doesn't do this as much as I would have liked it to do. Um, but I did try with the, with the last chapter to do that a little bit in the sense of kind of say that this is what we learn from law. And this is what we learn about how law operates. And this is what it means for those of us in Britain resisting the border at this moment. And what, and what I tried to do was apply it in a very particular way to the lesson of Windrush. Like in, because I was seeing um, with the Windrush scandal in particular, how there was always this invocation of the good citizen argument, the idea that these were law abiding citizens, that the law, that they've been stamped citizens um, and, and therefore they shouldn't be treated like this. And of course I had a strong reaction against this for lots of reasons. Um, one is like the technical legal argument that, you, that I don't think that it's clear that people were citizens when they were declared to be citizens of the United Kingdom and colonies. And also what you do if you invoke this argument that these people were citizens, and that's what the British Empire did in 1948 with the British Nationality Act, is it really elides the truth of the matter, which as you, you, you referred to in, in, your, in your comments, what was actually happening was Britain trying to strengthen or sh do a show of strength in relation to the empire to oppose Canada's kind of moves towards um, defining its own citizenship um, detached from British subjecthood. And so what we're losing sight of is, you know, the violent context in which um, British subjecthood um, was rolled out to, to racialize colony subjects and citizens. And of course, at a time when the movement was outwards to, to populate the settler, the settler colonies with, uh, with white British people. And, and then it was never, uh, it never occurred to lawmakers at the time with rolling out this kind of, this form of citizenship that, that racialized people would come to Britain, travel to Britain. As soon as they did, the movement was towards stopping that in any possible way. I mean, this is the truth of the story. So, and, and that was so, um, obscured in, in the wake of Windrush um, with this with this kind of they were citizens argument. And of course, it also creates the um, this this um, opportunity to say, well, if you're not a citizen, then we throw you under the bus. If you're not a citizen, you can just be drowned at sea. If you're not a citizen or if you are, you know, and, and you behave in a particular way that we deem uncivilized, we deprive you of your citizenship. You know, so it kind of opens people up still um, to 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 um, harm, to racialization, um, to violence. And so it was about kind of trying to speak to resistance movements um, in the way that I could um, is kind of a learning from from the law sort of way. Um, the ethics of writing about migration. Oh, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question. I, I, I don't know if I'm especially ethical. I, I, in fact, if I'm honest, um, when I first decided to write about asylum, I was young, I was um, doing my dissertation and my undergraduate studies, and I was despairing at the state of the world, and I wanted to save refugees. So I had the, the you know, that's me being honest, like, I just thought, I want to help people and like, so I'm going to do law. And so I, I really um, have um, a lot of time and, and sympathy for that kind of attitude. And I think that I encourage people to try to make the world a better place. Um, however, 
do so while understanding that the law is not the thing that is going to do that. So that's all I want people to take away, like come towards the subject, study it, um, you know, do do what you can in and outside academia. Um, but but don't carry the torch of the law as if this is going to be the thing that saves us, because it isn't. It's going to be working with people in our communities. It is going to be um, uh, joining um, movements. It is going to be doing the hard work of analysis that actually does um, critique the law and think long term, not always short termism in what we can achieve. Um, by you know, if we get the, the 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 state to change this particular law here and there, but always thinking long term about how the changes we're proposing are actually going to affect people who fall outside particular categories, and what does this mean for the for, in the long term? Um, but I'm happy, of course, to answer more questions about that. As for um, Ukraine, I mean, I share totally your frustration about um, uh, well, I you know, Western hypocrisy, but I think, as you say, I agree with you that it's actually, that it's complicity, um, that it's willful ignorance. It's also, um, it's it's malice. It's like, it's it's so much deeper, but then it's also just, it, it, it's also, um, uh, I mean, one, one of the things that I want to say on this is this is not the first time that we've seen a galvanization of the British public for, the purposes of protecting refugees or reaching out to refugees. And I always come back to the image of Alan Kurdi, the Syrian refugee who washed up on the Turkish beach and how all of a sudden we had people going on marches in Britain, kind of calling for refugees to be um, helped. And so this was a galvanization of the public. And I think similar to how we're seeing people signing up for like, you know, housing refugees on this, this government's kind of scheme um, that it's rolling out. But I think that the thing that allowed that to happen in relation to Alan Kurdi, and, and I wrote something about this at the time, was, I think, because he was a very light-skinned refugee child. I think that for the first time, there was something that was like woken up in British people's minds of being able to, or white British people's minds, and be able to kind of empathize um, in a way um, with, with uh, a, a group of people who have been vilified and racialized and constructed as violent inherently, um, um you know for 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 century really um and i th and i think we have to take that seriously because we know how the extent to which people feel empathy and humanize others correlates with implicit racial bias and i think that 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 that's important and of course we need to add to that the stereotyping that has happened in the media that has happened through legislation that has happened through prevent that has happened through the war in iraq and how like this horrific violence against racialized people, brown people, people who wear hijabs, people with beards. Like, you know, I think I think we've absolutely seen a situation where violence against these groups is so normalized that does not register as violence um, anymore. That this is just totally imaginable and totally acceptable and totally um, um, legitimate. But I think what I want to say from that is not like a, a despairing point, but more, a call to action to say that because sometimes I think, for example, if if the Iraq if the opposition to the Iraq war had been successful, like if that demonstration that had a million people on it had happened every day and the war hadn't happened, I, I often think to myself, would we have seen the Grenfell Tower fire happen? Would we have seen you know nearly five years on nothing having happened? Um, in terms of justice in that particular situation, responding to 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 the fact that they're still cladding on all of these buildings. I think that people are unable to humanize racialized people, brown people, partly because the resistance wasn't successful. Like we didn't manage to stop these things from happening. Um, and so it's not that I don't want people to take in Ukrainian refugees. I absolutely do. Um, you know, I, I want people to respond with feelings of empathy and et cetera. But I also want, I also want us to see um, that brown people are human too and to understand that actually the way the way our minds have come to work because of the levels of structural racism and violence and the complicity of the media and politicians and the kind of stoking of the fire of racial hatred that we can actually not all agree on who is human and who is not we may agree that the ukrainian refugee is a human but we absolutely don't agree um whether a person from Egypt crossing the channel in a small boat is, is human or not. You know, like we absolutely don't, we can't say that we agree on, on, on who is human, who is not. And it, it's, it's devastating, it's painful to watch and it's devastating. Um, 
but yeah, I'd love to get to a point where we could talk about this in a way that doesn't say, oh, we shouldn't be helping the Ukrainians or just or just sort of saying, um, I'm so frustrated by it that I'm not going to engage with these people suffering. No, it's about <laughs> recognizing who else is also suffering and, and, and trying to find ways of, of, of showing solidarity and, and yeah, building kind of stronger movements of solidarity. Anyway, I will stop there because I feel like I've gone on and on, but thank you so much, Rafif, um, for your comments um, about the book and for engaging with it. Thank you so much. So we have about uh, 15 minutes now, so we'll take, I know there's two questions already in the online audience that Sadia will bring to us, but are there any questions in the in-person audience? So uh, Sadia, can pass a mic if there's anything. Thank you, Sujit. Um, hi, Nadine. I enjoyed very much your presentation. And, and I'll preface my question by saying that I, I, I agree with the argument that you have expressed, and I like it very, very much. I want to come to it, however, through a tangent um, that is more uh, political than, than legal. So neoliberalism, globalization, financialization, um, in the last 40 years or so have destabilized, deconstructed, recomposed uh, working classes uh, around the world, including in this country. And in doing this created a huge sense of fluidity, uh, insecurity and degradation, uh, real degradation in living conditions for vast numbers of people in this country and in other parts of the world. Now the mainstream liberals have argued all this time, the Tony Blair type people have argued all this time that all these these processes are inevitable and people have just have to bear it because this is uh, the future and in any case there is no alternative uh, to that. But from the point of view of working classes, this process comes with uh, the withdrawal of public services, precarious uh, forms of labor, uh, social divisions, dismantling of a sense of community and citizenship in huge uh, a huge sense of insecurity, unhappiness, and stress. Historically, what we have seen is that the left comes in and says, no, we have to build a sense of community on the basis of equality and citizenship and uh, solidarity. And the right comes in and says, no, no, we have to build a sense of community through nationalism, exclusion, racialization, a sense of opposition, us and them. Or the left is saying we are all uh, together. The left has lost this argument as the left has lost in numerous areas of politics. Now, my question to you is, how do we operationalize the progressive element that is in your book in a way that appeals to the majority, the majority that voted for Brexit, the majority or the minority perhaps, but a substantial number that voted for Donald Trump, the substantial numbers that are voting for authoritarian uh, political leaders in many parts of the world building their sense of security and community through exclusion. How do we break this impasse uh, is my question to you. Thank you. And also just to add, so you can also ask questions to Rafif as well. And Rafif, you can also, also feel free to jump in and answer anything that you find that you want to ask. Um, any other questions in the audience? Um, Hi, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I was, my question is a little bit more straightforward, but builds a little bit on, on that. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, well, a lot of the things that you were saying evoke the idea of like decolonizing uh, border policy, right? Um, I was wondering if you can comment on sort of like the political obstacles beyond just, you know, uh, also uh, convincing the population that this is a necessary step, but what are other political obstacles do you identify for process of decolonization of the, of, of the politics of the borders? Should we take the online ones? Yeah. Uh, should we just take these two and then these two first? Yeah. And then online. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, Nadine, do you want to start? Oh, I mean, I'd be so happy as well for Rafi to jump in and to help or to uh, say what she thinks as well. But yeah, I mean, look, I don't have like easy answers um, for how to convince. Uh, people to get on board with the arguments that I'm making. I kind of feel like um, 
we have to do our best to try to articulate and see, uh, you know, how. I, and I'm not even proposing that it's even possible through writing a book to kind of persuade, you know, I, I think there's even like another level of engagement to say like, how do we engage with the public on something? Um, I, I guess I, I, I would hope that whoever does, and I did actually, off, I, I often thought while writing the book, you know, maybe people reading this book will have like an argument to make with people that they meet that disagree, you know, or or kind of hold up the law as being, you know, the thing that entitles them to this and doesn't entitle someone else to something like this, that the book might give you an argument in that faith, but I'm not, but it, but the book doesn't engage on, on that level of like trying to, you know, bring, bring together or communicate to kind of a, a public on, on that level. Um, but I mean, I do think, I don't know whether things are as dire as as you make them sound, at least I hope not. I mean, we've also seen movements like Black Lives Matter kind of take shape in the last couple, few years, which have brought together um, people um, recognizing some of the trends and the patterns and the relevance of this kind of story and history to the contemporary moment. Um, we've also seen um, the uh, very connected Kill the Bill movement um, in the wake of um, Sarah Everard's murder. Um, we've seen, um, you know, different groups who are um, who are targeted in very different ways by the state, and and uh, who have come together to oppose this bill, um, which targets all kinds of groups, um, whether Roma, whether the traveler population, um, uh, people who are uh, 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 victimized at schools and suspended from schools, people who, uh, who prisoners, people who protest, um, migrants who protest, you know, all kinds of groups have come together. I, and I think that's a positive. And I think that there's a, there is this discourse that from the government that is that 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 seeks, I think, to say, oh, everyone is divided and every and pit everyone against each other. When actually, if you look at the way these movements have arisen, I think we're seeing the opposite. I think we're seeing people um, coming together, people refusing to be divided, actually. Um, and so, I don't know whether things are as kind of hopeless. Um, you know, I'm not sure I can answer the question of how how we appeal how we appeal to the masses. But I don't know, Rafiq, did you want to come in at all on on either of those? Yeah, I mean, I completely understand the point about populism and how it seems like we have lost the argument. I think there is a lot of ground that was lost and it was partly lost because the left tended to tail end um, the right wing movements and, and rather than putting forward an internationalist pro migrant position, um, it would be let's try migration controls to appeal to populism. And once you start down that line, you just keep going lower and lower to the least common denominator and really open up that floodgate. Um, there is also this argument that we should say that migration is positive for the economy and put the migrants in good light. And that's how we're going to win people over. So we see lots of pictures of like the good migrant. Um, the problem with that is that that is also a racializing process of what is good, what is productive and what isn't. So I guess this is more an answer of what I don't think the left should do is sort of tail end the populist movements, but rather put forward a strong argument for, you know, how the political economy internationally is working, um, why wages are going lower, why public services are going down, because we don't win that argument by least common denominator kind of broad populist uh, populism from the left end, basically. Um, and I I think there are exciting movements, the way Nadine is saying, we are not at the level of, you know, facing the pushback just yet. And there's a lot of work to be done, but it needs to be done taking, actually taking leadership from refugees as well. It's not going to just happen, you know, in closed rooms where we're theorizing it. Thank you so much, uh, Sadir. Do you want to ask some of the questions? Online. Yeah, so we have two questions online. Uh, the first question is to Nadine uh, asking about methodology. So what was the methodology you used? Did you use in particular, oh, sorry. Um, I'll just read the question. What sort of methodology did you use in particular to figure out how the law shapes political identity and psyche regarding sentiments surrounding deserving and undeserving refugees? And the second question is, can you talk a little bit about how terrorism powers interact with immigrant law? Immigration law, sorry. 
I'm thinking about the denationalization, temporary exclusion orders, et cetera. Yeah, so in terms of um, methodology, I didn't, uh, it's difficult because um, in law, we don't really talk about methodology and we're certainly not taught anything like methodology. Usually it's just, um, you know, you're taught to read and understand legislation and case law, how to figure it out, how to find it, and then how to analyze it, you know, how to analyze judgments, how to analyze the law and how to apply it to fact scenarios. And we don't tend to be taught kind of really methodology. So I can't really answer the question around specific methodology. I mean, I can tell you that for this book, I didn't go out and do interviews. You know, it's not an, um, wasn't based on any kind of research methods that involved interviews or anything. Um, but uh, so, so, so in terms of how I figured out how the law kind of shapes um, identity and psyche, um, it would be, I suppose, um, in observing uh, the effects of law. So um, how the law makes um, people uh, vulnerable makes particular people disproportionately vulnerable to harm and premature death. Again, that's drawing on Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism. So really to look at what the legal effects, what the law, what the effects of the law are, how it produces people as disproportionately vulnerable. Um, and to do that, of course, you know, you're looking at the connections between what the law says and then the effects that it has. Um, and that's some that that's what I was interested in um, when I when I was when I was doing this work. Um, Sorry, the questions were there, but they've disappeared now. Oh, yeah. And how it shapes. Um, yeah, how it shapes. Psyche. And, and then the other thing in terms of psyches and mindsets, um, that was really just through observation, close observation of discourse, um, you know, looking at what the discourse was around Brexit and how um, claims to entitlement were being framed within the media by politicians. Um, and then and then and then and then trying to understand why it is. Um, that people feel um, entitled to say um, certain things about migrants or to make certain demands or to tell people to go back to where they came from or to say that because you don't have a legal right, you can be subjected or you can you deserve to be subjected to this kind of treatment. Um, and and so, yeah, I think if you if you put you can you can you can look at the effects of, of the law and you can also survey um, the the media and political and public discourse around you, which of course was everywhere during Brexit. I mean, the whole of, 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 of the debate around leaving the European Union was completely dominated by the question of migration. So it was also through observation and analysis of that kind of discourse as well. Um, I'm not sure I can really answer the second um, question very clearly because I'm not exactly sure um, what I'm being asked around terrorism powers. I'm not sure what what powers, um, temporary exclusion orders. I mean, in the book I in the book I write about um, uh, citizens citizenship deprivation in the context of terrorism and immigration law, mainly to argue um, how um, how immigration law enables the ever making of precarity. So making people's immigration status um, ever more precarious, um, uh, racialized people's immigration status ever more precarious. So if, if, if one is racialized, um, then they don't have the same secure attachment, um, can never have the same secure attachment to British subjecthood or citizenship in its current guise, because there are all kinds of things, including terrorism or increasingly other things like committing other serious crimes. Um, that that make people proximate to a situation where that citizenship would be deprived and also questions around even the ability to access nationality in the first place so naturalization processes and the likelihood of being successful at that also coming down um to uh you know things like the good character test which again invokes this idea that you know you can be deemed to be um civilized and therefore you will be given citizenship. You can nat you can naturalize. However, if your uh, finances are not in order, or you've been accused of um, having committed a crime, indeed, if you arrived at, as as an asylum seeker or refugee who is being um, uh, um, who is who, who who was accused of um, you know being part of a particular organization um, in 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 one's home country, that can mean that you're then not allowed. Um, to naturalize. So, I mean, those are the ways in which I talk about in the book, but sorry, that's probably not, not the answer that you were looking for. 
Thank you so much. Um, so we basically have a minute and a half or two minutes left. Uh, so there is one question online um, that's quite long from Yasmin that you can also see in the Q&A box um, where she's asking, could you maybe speak more to the question of dehumanization, specifically that tension you pointed to about disconnecting from the struggle of communities that get sympathy because it's whipped up around recognition, et cetera. I really struggle with the question of human, humanitarianism and I'm wondering if you have thoughts on this because sometimes the complete dismissal of humanitarianism is too simple of an argument because there is potential within it, at least I think, to overcome dehumanization. I'm thinking about how racial categorization gets subverted in the space of humanitarianism, I guess. Uh, so I think maybe this is a question to both of you and then yeah, we just have a minute left. So if you have like a short answer to this big question. Rafi, if you wanna go first. Um, I just want to say a couple of things very quickly. I think Nadine really underplays her methodological innovations in the book, uh, because I think looking at law with a racial lens is not something that a lot of people do. So I would encourage students to read it. Um, you know, a lot of people make a big fuss about border as method. I think using race and law as method is also really important. And the looking at the documents. Um, I think we had two questions that are similar, one about humanitarianism and one about immigration lawyers. And I think and, and that the law can be useful. We still need it. It's, a, it's an arena of resistance. Um, for me, I, I get asked a lot of this question about Palestine as well. Should you use international law or not? And the issue is not so much black and white. It's to use things in relation to movements and get leadership from the movements rather than thinking the law is what will save us, which I think is Nadine's exact quote, the law will not save us. Thanks, I feel a like you just answers questions about my book so much better than me, I should just nominate you to talk about it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, okay, fine, I accept on methodology. I just think I'm not schooled in that language. And sometimes when you're doing something that feels very, um, I don't know, natural or just just the only way to do something. You you don't really see, um, you know, what might be particularly helpful or special about it. But but I'm so glad that you do, so you can talk about it in a way that I can't. Um, and and as for the question of you know when to use the law and and when not, um, I I also actually and I've written about this too. It, you know, I am not saying abandon the law and never use it. You know, sometimes the law is actually really, really important. Well, it is really, really important in the individual cases. Like even when I'm critical of the arguments made around the Windrush being citizen, I absolutely support, you know, lawyers making the arguments that they need to make in the individual moments in the rate in relation to um, their clients, because that that really matters. Secondly, um, I also think it matters which government is in power because it does matter which law is in place. I'm not saying that all law is, you know, uh, terrible and so we don't need to worry about it. It actually does matter what family unification laws are in place. And, you know, who has access to um, basic services and and these kind of little these are not little things. These like really matter in people's lives. And so we should be interested in the law and we should be arguing for it to be um, reformed and changed. I think what I'm also just saying on the other side is that we need some long-termism in terms of our um, um, of our struggle, in terms of our political um, action, in terms of how we write and think about the law. We need to always be acknowledging what are the um, implications of invoking the law. Um, and it can't be our only path, but we absolutely need to defend it. I'm not saying, oh, who cares whether they repeal the Human Rights Act or not. It absolutely matters that they do not repeal the Human Rights Act and people should be spending their time arguing that that, that does not happen. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I hope that's clear. Um, yeah, that I'm not kind of saying abandon it. Um, I, I agree with Rafif that it needs to be kind of drawn on as and when is useful, but never you never losing sight of um of the of of our sort of long-term goals of racial justice and um yeah, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Thank you so much to both of you. And I know Nadine that you have to go. So um uh, thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Rafif. And thank you to the audience members online and in person. Those of you that are here in person, we're going to the Somerset Room. So just follow Sadir and we'll go there together for wine and meze. Unfortunately, Nadine and Rafif aren't able to join us for that, uh, but maybe another time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>